Today's topic is he who house rules cool or fool. Welcome to Table Scraps, short discussions about board, card, and tabletop gaming submitted by the viewing audience and discussed with the viewing audience. Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Table Scraps, the show where we discuss a topic on tabletop gaming with the live streaming YouTube audience. And I am your host, Chaz Marler, and today's topic is all about house rules. What are they? When are they beneficial? And when do they go too far? Well, as I was putting together my thoughts on today's topic, I came up with three different ideas and examples of house rules, which I will give you in just a moment, because first I'm going to actually present the actual real question that was presented to us before I completely forget. Let's get to today's topic, which is from Trevin Taylor, who says, house rules, are you for them? Against them? Are they disrespectful to the designers and the playtesters? Are they cheating? Do they ever actually improve a game or are they just quote unquote free parking? Well, I thought that this was an excellent question there, uh, Trevin. So as I was putting together my thoughts on this episode, I came up with three examples of house rules and kind of how they affected the, the games that we played and kind of three levels of house ruling. So I wanted to present these and get your guys' uh, feedback on it. The first type of house rule is a house rule that really doesn't change anything. It doesn't have an impact on the gameplay or the strategies. It's just something to streamline and, and maybe reduce downtime in a game. An example of this would be uh, Carcassonne. The, I think the standard rule is drawing the little tile that you're going to play at the beginning of your turn. Uh, however, there is a very common house rule of drawing the tile at the end of your turn so you can look at it and kind of figure out what you're going to do with it as everyone else plays their turns. If everyone's doing this, all it does is change the amount of time you have to look at your tile. It doesn't really change any mechanisms of how the game plays or anything else. It's just something to give you more time to think and also then reduces downtime in the, in the game. And if everyone is doing it this way, everyone has the same increased amount of time to think about, about uh, what they're gonna do with this tile. So I think that that is a house rule that doesn't, isn't cheating, isn't disrespectful to the game designers or play testers. I think that's just uh, something that as people use a product sometimes, whether it's a board game or a socket wrench, sometimes they'll find out ways of using it um, in practical applications that during development and testing just weren't seen because it wasn't a real world environment. So that, that's, that's the first type. Now the second type of house rule I thought of is modifying the rules slightly, maybe even could be considered creating variations on the game. Um, a game that, wow, just this last weekend, that was the prime example of this, is um, over the weekend, I played a game called Speculation, which is a stock trading game um, by Queen Games, I believe. And it, it's very simple. You just have this stock market track that goes along and you have about eight different stocks that are going along and each stock will go up in value um, at different rates. So you're just trying to buy and sell these stocks at the right time by playing cards. And the, each player will play cards that will manipulate which stock, stocks go up and how fast they go up on this track. And you're just trying to buy low, sell high. Now, everybody has a, a, a deck of like nine cards, the same nine cards, and like you draw two and you choose one to play. And during this game, I could not stop thinking about house rules of well, what if you drew like five cards and you chose two to play and then burned the rest. So you're going through your deck faster, but you get a few more options so the players can actually manipulate the stock market a little more. Or what if uh, we had other abilities to determine how far stock goes up? Or maybe each player was in control of one stock and they got to modify one of them each turn or something. And there was just all of these layers of house rules that were coming to mind. And it wasn't because the game wasn't enjoyable. I think it's important to note that at least in my own experience, when I am playing a game and all of these house rulesy types of thoughts start to enter my mind, it's usually because I'm really enjoying the game and want to kind of see what else, it, what other little twists and turns can be added to it um, because I'm really enjoying the experience and I just want to push it a little bit even further, which was the case with speculation. But 
all of those little variations of card play that were going through my mind kind of fit the bill of variations of the game. It wasn't like changing the mechanisms or, well, it was changing the mechanisms. It wasn't changing the goal of the game per se. It was just changing some of the uh, variations on the mechanisms that you're playing. So that was kind of the example of the second, second scenario. The third scenario fits more into changes that change the goals, objectives, strategies that you'll play in the game completely. And the example I had on this one was uh, another game I played over this weekend called Via Nebula. And in this game, players are building little cities and buildings uh, across this map that's kind of covered in a fog. And as they're doing these things, they're clearing out the fog to open up more spaces to transport resources and eventually build more buildings by uh, transporting those resources over the areas that uh, the fog has been cleared away. So you're kind of increasing movement on the map and building new things on the map and, and unlocking resources that everybody can then uh, transport down these open uh, roadways that are opening up as the fog goes away. Well, as I was playing this game, I was enjoying it, but this one fit into the category where I was like, well, it would be really interesting to see what would happen if, like, say, I opened up this little cluster of resources. And sure, everyone can still use them if they have access to them through the roadways that are being opened up through the fog. But what if the person who opened up the cluster of resources was able to, like, charge a tax or something on everyone else that took one of their resources? That way they're, they're gaining victory points or maybe even a new currency that's used in the game. And just little things like that. Maybe as you open up a roadway through the fog, you know, having a toll booth or something that you charge other players attacks for going down the roads that you open up. And this kind of fit into the category that I think is maybe the closest to what Trevin was talking about of things that weren't even in the game designer's um, thoughts or, for lack of a better phrase, best interest when the game was designed. Things that really change the game and almost turn it into a completely different game. Is that level of house ruling even house rules anymore? Or have we then crossed the threshold into just completely different game? And is is it disrespectful and is it breaking things? And at that point, should you just go and you know create a completely different game uh, with those different house rules? So those are the three examples I have. So what I wanna know from the live streaming chat here is, what house rules do you do? What are your thoughts? And what do you think about those three variations of house rules? Are there others out there? And would you use these or would you not use these because of the levels that they would change the game? Let's turn to the live chat and let's see what people are saying right now. Our first question comes from Colin, who says, I think if a house rule makes the game more accessible, you know, provides an interesting variant, or adds custom content without breaking the feel and balance of the game, then the house rule is all right. I think in that scenario, the first two examples that I gave uh, would fit in that, and the third one may maybe wouldn't be compatible with what you're saying, Colin. And, and I think your approach to it is com completely viable and, um, and, and makes sense. So that, that, that's good. Let's continue on to see what others are thinking. Homemaker Hobbies, who says, we use house rules to alter the game just a bit so our six-year-old can play the games with us. As he learns the game, we take away the house rules. Oh, here is a whole new perspective on house rules where house rules can be used to help younger players get into gaming. And I, I have to admit, with my own daughter, especially when, we, when she was younger, I would do this same thing as well. And as time went by, uh, take away, strip away more of the, the house rules to reveal the actual more complex game underneath as she became uh, old enough to appreciate it. I, I think that that can make for a really good way to advocate for house rules, a really good use for them. So I'm really glad that you brought that up, uh, Homemaker Hobbies, because it's definitely a very practical application of house rules. The next comment comes from Christopher, who says, the best house rules streamline play, like drawing tiles at the end of the turn for tile laying games. Now, I think I've mentioned before that uh, Christopher is a really good friend of mine. Uh, we've played a lot of games together. And I just want to say, Christopher, that I think I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with your comment there. Because in the games that we have played together and the games that we have house ruled together, I think some of the most interesting 
and best stories that have developed from the house rules that we've done have come from us doing house rules that have done far more than just streamline the game. Um, I remember the variation that we made on Settlers of Catan, which I actually still want to make a video about one of these days. But that game of Settlers of Catan, where we added the little warlords and um, the raiding the cities and stuff like that, still stands out to me as one of my favorite Settlers of Catan gameplay experiences and definitely one of my favorite house ruling experiences. And when we did that, we definitely went whoosh, in the complete <laughs> opposite direction of um, streamlining the game. Sasha joins us to say that games should be fun. You know, it's your game. You should have fun. If you need to house rule in order to have more fun, do so. There is no disrespect to the developer in doing that. You can't make the perfect game for everyone. I can see the argument of not wanting to be disrespectful to a game designer by changing their game design. But Sasha, I think I do lean more towards your point of view of this is a game that you bought. It's now in your collection. Have fun with it any way that you want. I mean, I, I'm a big advocate also of, you know, harvesting ideas and components from games, you know, and tinkering with game designs as well. And I think that aligns with that. So, Sasha, I, I, I see that and I can agree completely with your attitude of it's your game. Have fun with it, whatever that entails. So there we go. Kabuki mentions another Carcassonne variant, which is another Carcassonne house rule is taking three tiles on your turn. So you have a hand to play with to pick from and to place on your turn. This should be for more experienced players, obviously. So the question becomes there, Kabuki, in drawing three tiles instead of one, does that cross the threshold of changing the game so much that it's now a variant? Or is it still just, you know, a, a way to play the same game? How much change do we have to make to a board game before it crosses that line where we have actually created a completely different experience that someone who is unfamiliar with the game would be playing a completely foreign game uh, and not playing the game that they would expect to have been playing in the first place. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing people's uh, ideas on that in the comments as well. But for now, let's continue on to the next comment here by Toyota Wolf. Toyota says, I'm all for house rules because in some cases it allows you to do things like shorten overly long games or adjust difficulties to lower the beatdown that you suffer, especially in co-op games. Sometimes house rules serve to fix broken games in this respect. There was uh, a couple episodes ago uh, there was someone was mentioning uh, house ruling co-ops specifically and wondering if that was cheating uh, because a co-op is designed to be everyone playing against the game. And if you modify the rules of the co-op game, the co-op, the game itself, which in a co-op scenario, you know, technically is a player. Well, the co-op game itself doesn't have a say in the decision to make those house rules. So are you cheating against one of the players in the, that case the player being the game itself but i i think that it's one of those things where people need to not necessarily take things that seriously i i think it still falls in the camp of have fun but again it could change the experience for someone who's never played the game before and if they went off and played the game with someone else they could be like whoa what's going on this is a totally different game which would kind of be jarring to that player so i don't know what I do know, though, is our next statement is going to be from Stefan, who just says, if house rules make it better, use them. And if they don't, don't. I think then that that falls into the uh, way of thinking that a lot of us seem to have here, that if it's a general consensus that it's going to make the game funner, go for it. Which, which is nice, because it reduces some of that anxiety uh, that Trevin's question posed of, you know, is, is this, you know, disrespecting the game designer? So I, I think the general consensus here is then, you know, no, you know, games are designed to be fun, you know, and, and the people playing the game should have final say on what is being, being fun for them. And I think that's cool. MM says, when it comes to house rules, I think it's fine. But if you have people new to gaming or to your group, you should explain them as house rules and let them decide if they want to partake. 
I agree. Uh, I think that's the kind of that's a much more eloquent way of stating what I've been trying to say. Um, if it's someone who's new to the game or the group, kind of letting them know up front, setting the expectations of, hey, we are going to add a twist to this game. This is not the out of the box way it's played. So they are aware of that fact. I think that is, if you're going to house rule, I think that's a really important thing to do. Otherwise, you could end up in a scenario um, where the person plays the game again and they're like, what's going on? Or they're completely lost because the game is nothing like what they expected. And that could tarnish the experience for them, too, because they are um, not getting the game that they thought they were going to, you know, they're not getting the play experience that they thought they were going to get. So very good point there. Let's go to our last comment for the episode, which is from Peter, who says, we tend not to house rule very much. Oh, good. Here's a good opposite perspective. We tend not to house rule too much. We'll work around some oddities in the rules or look for ways to streamline play, but we try to indicate that house rules are in play if we're playing with others. So there's a good perspective that you try to mitigate the implementation of house rules as much as possible, which... I can respect because, again, my thoughts on it are if you house rule a game too much, you eventually get to the point where you're playing a different game. And so trying to play the game itself as much as possible and get as much out of it as possible certainly has merit. A thing that also has merit is all of the chat comments that unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to this episode. But I appreciate everybody who's joining the discussion. And if you have thoughts or ideas or comments or questions still left on this topic, you're more than welcome to post them either on our Facebook page or in the YouTube comments below. And while you're doing that, make sure you subscribe for more board game news, reviews, and commentary. And I also want to let everybody know that episodes like this are made possible by viewers like you who have been supporting Pair of Dice Paradise's Pod Pledge fundraising campaign. It really does make a difference and it's really appreciated. So thank you very much. Until next time, I've been Chaz Marler, who, along with the YouTube live streaming chat, have been serving up some table scraps. Talk to you again soon. Now this is the this is going to be the first recording session of our new batch of table scraps episodes. So I apologize, I'm a little out of practice, but I think this is just like riding a bike. Everything is going to come back to me. So what does this do? <laughs> <laughs>